Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. My name is Jamie Johnson and I'm the political and legal correspondent. And this being an election year, we're now going to hit our political time where we've been uh, dealing with municipal issues and so forth, but now the state and uh, local partisan elections are coming up this fall. In fact, we have a recall that uh, about the time that this gets played, that recall election will be over with. And many people say with thanks, but I want to welcome our guest today who is a candidate for uh, Congress, Pat Kreitlow. Pat, nice welcome to, to the see show. You, Jamie. Thank you very much. Now, Pat, we're going to ask you a little bit about your background, but we want to be right up front because some people might not recognize you. I know that you have served political office before and you have TV personality, so those people that got Eau Claire uh, TV know you. But the seventh CD is a whole new thing. In fact, most of our viewers um, had been in the third district right. for the longest time. Yeah. So let's first start with that. Where is mm -hmm. the seventh CD going to be sure. for this election? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. And again, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm running in the seventh congressional district. The seventh congressional district is the one that Dave Obie had represented for 42 years before he retired in 2010. At that time, it was roughly 20 counties. Now it's about 26 counties or parts of counties. And the biggest change around here is that St. Croix County was moved into the seventh congressional district. It had been in Ron Kine's third district for all these years, but it was moved into the seventh. Uh, so now it's basically, uh, all of Northwest Wisconsin, from St. Croix, uh, from Hudson out to Wausau, then up to uh, Upper Michigan, and then way back over to uh, Duluth Superior. So that uh, whole big chunk now comprises the 7th Congressional District that I'm running in. Prior to this, I served as a state legislator, uh, a state senator in the Wisconsin legislature representing the 23rd State Senate District. And that basically stretched from Eau Claire Chippewa Falls out to just about Wausau. It was a big chunk of the uh, Highway 29 corridor. And then prior to that, as you mentioned, a lot of people uh, remember my uh, years, just about 10 years at Channel 13 in Eau Claire, most of that anchoring the 6 and 10 o'clock news before leaving that in 2005 to run for the legislature in 2006. And TV 13, as you know, covered a big chunk of western Wisconsin, but because of the way cable systems are and the Twin City stations, uh, not everybody uh, received TV 13 out this way, even though we covered so many news stories that were out here because we wanted to cover Wisconsin stories, Wisconsin people, what are people in power saying and doing or not doing for the taxpayers and the consumers and the workers of, of Western Wisconsin. I really enjoyed that as a journalist, but enjoyed taking it to, uh, to a new level as a state legislator. I uh, got to do a lot of good things and now think that there are more good things that can be done in Washington to put an end to a, a Congress that has become an absolute train wreck of dysfunction. And so that's why I'm challenging the incumbent Republican Sean Duffy this November. Okay, so now you got a lot in on that answer. Mm -hmm. Good job, by the way. Thanks. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your background because yeah. you mentioned uh, the job uh, with TV and the job with the state of Wisconsin as a state senator. Right, and then prior uh, to that, I'd been a journalist in, in a few other communities, uh, Rice Lake, uh, West Bend, uh, notable among them. But for me, it all began uh, at UW-Eau Claire. Uh, which I attended in the early 1980s, and it's where I met my wife, Sherry. Uh, she grew up on a dairy farm out near Manitowoc. Uh, my dad lived in Eau Claire. My mom lived in St. Paul. Uh, my dad was a, a union brakeman on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad, uh, so he worked the line between St. Paul and Eau Claire. Uh, so both communities were, uh, were kind of uh, part-time hometowns for me before I went to uh, Eau Claire for college uh, for journalism, and again, where I met Sherry. We uh, spent some time in Milwaukee where she attended the Medical College of Wisconsin. She's now an OBGYN with the Marshfield Clinic System. Uh, we have two adult daughters and a five-year-old grandson. Uh, so uh, we, we're now uh, empty nesters and uh, enjoying this next phase of our lives, which includes a, a very busy political campaign. But growing up, uh, I was raised by a, a single mom, the oldest of uh, four kids. And so I, I know well how important it is to have opportunities for people that want to work hard. If you want to work hard, if you want to study hard, there should be opportunities available for you to go to school or to be able to, uh, to get a job. Okay. Nobody expects anything to be handed to you, right. but you should at least have the opportunity to prove that you can work hard, and that's what my background enabled me to do. Okay, so you've tied in the background to kind of the reason for running for office, and I appreciate that too. Mm -hmm. One thing that I wanted to also, we talked about where the 7th CD mm -hmm. will be, and it's changed. Of course, it changes generally every census. Mm -hmm. But usually it's a shift of 10 or 20,000 voters, and you can do that by moving 
a small amount of lines and people generally know they're going to be in a district from year to year. Our third CD, which has comprised most of western Wisconsin for decades and decades, mm -hmm. um, originally stretched, I remember, before the 1990 census, right. almost up to Douglas County. Mm -hmm. And it just gradually has come further south and now St. Croix County. But, and we've had David Obi on last fall and he kind of showed how m much the change was and it's kind of drastic. We haven't had to deal with that change until now this fall election. Right. There's been a lot of talk. Are those boundaries that you described earlier, are those set or is that still yeah. up for court review? Those are set. There, there is still a, a very, very, very slim chance that, that a court could uh, come into it because the, the court case hasn't been completely finalized yet. But every indication is the lines are where they are, which is perfectly fine. You, you always play the hand that you're dealt. And in, in the case of this congressional district, the addition of St. Croix County simply means that all of the voters here now have an opportunity to um, really make their position known on whether this Congress controlled by the Tea Party is working for America or not. And so as they get their first opportunity to vote for Sean Duffy or not, uh, they're getting a chance to say whether the, the, the House of Representatives has done anything to help encourage job creation to close loopholes, to stop outsourcing our jobs to other countries, to really well, tackle the deficit fairly. And if they've done none of those things, then they have an opportunity to make sure Sean Duffy does not serve St. Croix County. Well, I think that you have touched on some of the issues I want to get into a little bit of detail, sure. not extreme detail, otherwise we'll be here two hours. Yeah. But jobs and deficit, that seems to be the number two, uh, number one and two issues yeah. uh, throughout the whole country. So it doesn't, not just particular to the 7th District. But let's start with jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that you talk about is investing in the future to create jobs. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of debate and there's going to be people, usually the partisan ones, who will never agree whether in fact some of the stimulus actually helped the economy. But uh, w according to President Obama and the people who passed that first stimulus package, they need, that was what the economy needed. Mm -hmm. Where do you see and what would you be running on as a way of investing in the future to create jobs? First and foremost is about this. Put American jobs first. Let's have real incentives toward actual job creation, not these one-size-fits-all corporate loopholes. Let's tie tax incentives to creating jobs. There's a whole host of areas where there is a need for job creation, whether it's in American manufacturing, American construction, medical and high-tech research, um, new energy industries, or even just retraining and education so that laid-off workers can get new jobs. Let's put creating American jobs first. And you've seen a lack of any such action by this Congress. Instead, they have passed budgets um, on the House of Representatives side that increase the amount of incentive that would go for multinational corporations to create jobs outside of America and to leave American dollars outside of America. That needs to change. Well, you mentioned closing loopholes because I think I've heard it now through three election spans about closing the loopholes for uh, the oil companies and the offshore companies that are making billions. Mm -hmm. um, yet everyone talks and runs on that. They even get elected on that issue, but then nothing ever happens. Why is that? Well, uh, unfortunately, the, the people whose loopholes get closed still have a lot of money, and that buys you a lot of political ads. When I lost my legislative seat in 2010, it was because people uh, that side of the aisle said that uh, taxes went up. What happened was loopholes got closed. And as a Wisconsin legislature, we stopped rewarding one-size-fits-all loopholes, and instead we tied state tax policy to say tax incentives come when you hire Wisconsin workers. And so while we closed those loopholes and it was the right thing to do, there were still some very well-funded special interests that were able to turn that into a message that uh, didn't sit well in 2010. But the policy is still solid, and it, what should be happening at Congress at the congressional level as well is tie tax incentives to creating American jobs and close loopholes the way we did when I was in the legislature. 
Okay, so you said using tax policy. Mm -hmm. um, how might that be done? Well, again, it's making sure that any corporate tax credits, any breaks that you, you get, uh, you don't get uh, whether you create a job here or outsource a job, but to actually demonstrate uh, job creation and expansion, whether it's in uh, you know, research and development or whether it's in uh, a business expansion uh, or, or a whole host of other activities where you can demonstrate that you're engaging in the practices that are going to lead to job creation here at the domestic level. Uh, unfortunately, so many uh, multinational corporations that have an American address have been adding jobs overseas rather than here, and that needs to change. Unfortunately, the, the, the Paul Ryan budget that Sean Duffy voted for does completely the opposite. It, it rewards uh, the ability to create new jobs outside of the USA. Okay, well, I'm going to hold the thought on the Ryan budget because I want to come back to that, sure. but I'm going to shift a little bit regarding creating jobs because... Um, it doesn't sound like you're advocating necessarily for just increased spending across the board, but more of a targeted approach to fiscal policy. Yeah, it, it's all about doing things in a, in a targeted manner and playing to the, the, you know, the strengths of, of a particular sector. You can do things in the short term that, that create jobs using the private sector. Uh, for example, uh, making sure that our roads and bridges you know, stop crumbling or even falling down. We have sewer lines that are a century old. These things aren't getting any younger by the day. And so when you have a Congress that is uh, still stalling a transportation bill, for example, after months and months and months, that means so many of, of our men and women are sitting at home when they could be on a job site someplace making sure that our, our roads and bridges and sewer lines are updated. But the same goes for our utility lines. Let's expand uh, you know, high-speed uh, broadband uh, internet service to more of rural Wisconsin so that business can, can stay and, and thrive in those areas. Uh, you can also do the same in, in, in energy industries in making sure that you know, a wind turbine may not go up here in St. Croix County uh, or in other places in Wisconsin, but there's no reason why that can't be built here in Wisconsin or where that or some other energy industries can't be designed, sold, and distributed through Wisconsin-based industries. So those are just a couple of different examples of where you can be proactive to encourage private sector job creation, something we're not seeing at all in Washington these days. All right. Well, uh, let's, let's shift to Medicare now because Medicare is one of those entitlement programs that uh, the nonpartisan economists uh, tend to agree needs to be reformed in order to just save the program. Um, it's got an expiration date, as does Social Security, and it tends to shift depending on who's analyzing the numbers. But nonetheless, uh, we do have the baby boomer bubble, right. and we have fewer people earning wages and more people retiring every month. So uh, what would you do with regard to Medicare? Here's the, the number one thing I would do not end it, which is essentially what Sean Duffy and the, the Tea Party want to do, is completely dismantle and break the promise that we've made to American workers all these years that says, if you put in decades of hard work, waiting for you at the other side of that will be a retirement with dignity, not one where you risk going bankrupt in your old age as soon as you start getting sick and, and, and running into high medical bills. So you keep the promise. But because of demographics, because we've always known the baby boomers are coming along, you make the right adjustments that keep costs from growing out of control. For example, you start paying for quality instead of quantity. You know, one particular uh, medical group here in Wisconsin has already saved uh, American taxpayers well over $100 million over the past five years by improving the efficiency of, of health care in the Medicare system. They have the kinds of incentives that you won't see with for-profit uh, insurance companies because Medicare is looking to, with a, a limited pool of taxpayer dollars and has to fund health care for millions of people. So there are improvements that you can make in Medicare, but the thing you don't need to do is give our seniors a coupon that loses value year by year and says, well, you just hop right into the shark tank of the, the, you know, the private for-profit market and uh, good, luck, good luck finding an individual policy. That's what uh, Duffy and, and uh, the Republican Tea Party folks want to do, and that's not what anybody wants for our Medicare system. 
Okay, and when you say not end it, are you saying here that literally that's what Sean Duffy wants to do is end Medicare? Wants to end Medicare as we know it now, as a system, you, you called it an entitlement when in fact workers have paid for it. This is something that their hard-earned dollars have gone into year after year so that when they retire, health care security will be available to them. The Ryan budget that Sean Duffy voted for makes Medicare less secure. Seniors would be paying $6,000 extra a year out of pocket for coverage that that coupon will not cover. Okay, but just to be fair, I mean, they're not talking about not allowing people who have paid into the system to have some type of health care. But to have less health care by giving them essentially a voucher that's going to be worth, uh, studies say, about $6,000 less. That's money that would come out of pocket where a senior would have to go somehow wade through the whole private insurance market. And any individual out there who's under 65 who has tried to buy health insurance on their own rather than through an employer can tell you what a maze it is of, of uh, you know, corporate bureaucracy and forms and, and, and complications out there. And that's what they want our seniors to do. After decades of merely saying, you work hard, we will have you know, health care options available for you, that's what we need to improve upon, and there are ways to mend it without ending it. Okay, but even hasn't President Obama engaged in some cutting of Medicare with the passage of uh, the health care initiative? And, and what that did was, was it ended a basically a form of corporate welfare towards some of the for-profit insurance companies that were giving them a substantial premium for almost no increase in the quality of care. And so the, the cuts that were made through the Affordable Care Act were cuts to more the corporate bureaucracy side of health care for seniors rather than what the Ryan budget wants to do, and that is actually have a complete decrease in the amount of coverage that seniors would get by giving them a coupon and, and telling them to go buy their own plan. Well, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act. and. Uh, that was passed uh, by when the Democrats had control of Congress and then uh, they were promptly voted out of office and that I think was the uh, achievement if you will of uh, you know the Tea Party actually is kind of taking credit for that and uh, they're talking about repealing it you don't hear much talk about replacing although I did see Sean Duffy on Fox News mm -hmm. talking about how we need to replace uh, the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's your position on the Affordable Care Act and what would you do uh, to improve it? We can build upon the reforms that were passed that reined in the way that health insurance companies had complete control over health care, basically inserting themselves into the relationship between a doctor and a patient. But, it, you know, you can't help but note that it was very early on, the very first promise that Sean Duffy uh, broke to the uh, voters when he said, I will not vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act unless there is a replacement bill ready to go. Well, there wasn't, and he voted for repeal anyway. And for months afterwards, people said to him, where's the Republican alternative? Where's the replacement bill? There still isn't one. He has written up a little something on his own and submitted it, but it is a poor substitute for uh, actually taking forward the reforms that were made in the Affordable Care Act of making sure that we close the donut hole for seniors, that make sure that we don't uh, allow insurance companies to uh, use pre-existing conditions to deny people care, to allow young adult children to stay on their parents' policies uh, up until age 26. Some of these things that would do incredible things to increase health care security and start to rein in uh, costs because more people would have coverage to begin with. But he hasn't, and they haven't, had an answer to it. So we either build upon what was done in 2009-2010, uh, or we do what they want to do, and we go all the way back to square one, where over 50% of American bankruptcies are related to high medical bills. That's not acceptable, and that's the direction he wants to go in. Okay, well, let's go to another one that I think even uh, Congressman Duffy would agree, is cutting wasteful spending. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone can agree that you don't have to have a D behind your name or an R behind your name to, uh, to advocate for that. But how would your approach differ from maybe Congressman Duffy's? I thought it was interesting to note that last August, during that embarrassing debate about increasing the debt ceiling, we ended up with a Republican-led package that led to deficit uh, reduction of less than a trillion dollars. When on the table 
were bipartisan proposals that would have cut more than four trillion dollars from the deficit. Are you referring to Simpson Bowles? Nope, uh, referring to other bipartisan plans that, that were put out by other members of Congress, by the White House and by others, but instead of getting that kind of significant deficit re relief, we got less than a trillion dollars worth and primarily through middle class, you know, cuts to middle class programs because Sean Duffy and his colleagues would not support cutting the tax breaks at the very top, the oil company subsidies and other things, by a penny. By protecting every penny of cuts and breaks at the very top, we don't have the widespread deficit relief that we so desperately need. The GAO report, there was a GAO report itself that spelled out hundreds of millions, of, of billions of dollars rather in, in duplication out, out there uh, in, in areas where multiple agencies perform the, the, the same function or there are duplicative uh, products or programs. There's no shortage of, of, of waste and inefficiencies, but we have a Congress right now that won't also tie it in to some of the waste and bloat in our tax code, like oil company subsidies at a time when we've been paying record high gas prices. You've got to have a bipartisan all-encompassing package that tackles the deficit the right way with the right priorities and not just ending Medicare while you're continuing tax breaks for the, the very wealthiest among us. When you say cutting spending the right way, obviously there was a compromise mm -hmm. at, that many congressmen and senators held their nose and voted for mm -hmm. for the sake of raising the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. But um, those involved automatic cuts, half of which are defense and half are the domestic programs. Um, there's been already alternatives to that. In fact, the, the Ryan budget was an alternative to that that passed the House, and of course the Senate hasn't passed a budget in several years now. But you know, what, what do you see, will, what will it take? Because we could cut massive amounts. You could cut all the domestic uh, discretionary spending. You're still not going to balance the budget. What are we, what are we going to need to do to sit down and end this deficit and get back to where we were in the late 90s where pa President Clinton and a Republican Congress mm -hmm. passed the pay as you go. Yep. You, you, you need all three elements for, for real deficit relief. You need relief on the spending side. You need to get rid of you know, waste, inefficiency, and duplication. You have to look at paying for all of this fairly, which ends, uh, for example, when you talk about entitlements, talk about the entitlement of feeling entitled to the millionaire tax breaks that were passed back when we had budget surpluses. Now we have budget deficits. And some of these folks at the very top still feel entitled to the Bush tax cuts. It's not right that a mega millionaire like Mitt Romney is paying a lower tax rate than most Americans around here who are paying you know, 25, 28, 35 percent, and he's paying somewhere around 15, 16 percent. So you need to attack the spending end of it. You need to attack how you pay for it. And the third element is you need to grow the total pie. You need to grow the economy. And you're not going to do that until we start investing again in growing American jobs. And the lack of any formal jobs program by this Congress has really prevented that growth, which would help reduce our deficit. At what point does the deficit have to grow as far as a percentage of GDP or, you know, the debt to um, our, the GDP, um, comparing like to Greece and so forth that are, where they're over 100 percent. I think we're at 69 percent right now before you would sign on to austerity measures. Well, austerity in and of itself isn't the, the kind of, solu it just isn't a solution because austerity assumes that you can only cut your way to prosperity. And you can't. You can't tax your way to prosperity either. But there isn't anybody out there saying we can tax our way to prosperity. Unfortunately, there are people out there saying we can somehow cut our way to prosperity. We can't. We've tried trickle-down e economics in one form or another for 30 years. It doesn't work. It's a failure. It was never intended to work. It was a giveaway to certain friends and a privileged few. And that mindset has got to end as we look at ways to rein in wasteful spending, but also grow the economy and pay for everything fairly in our tax code and not have it be full of loopholes and breaks. Okay, well you talk about waste cutting wasteful spending and duplication. And uh, what I hear the mantra from the, tech, from the 
Tea Party is let's cut the Department of Energy, the Department of Commerce, and Department of Education. Mm -hmm. They're all duplicating efforts that are that states are already doing on their own. Let's just reduce the size of the federal government, and therefore we don't have to raise taxes. We just cut those three departments all together. Yeah, and, and that, that pays for a sliver of what we need for actual deficit relief. In other words, it much like the cuts in, in foreign aid or some people want to cut, everybody has a, a, a pet thing that they would like to cut. And you can cut 100% of whatever that thing is, but that isn't a plan for a national economy. A plan for a national economy says, what should each line in the budget look like? Should a particular agency continue to function? But also, how are we going to grow the economy? And how are we going to make changes to our tax code? You know, the last major overhaul of the tax code was done 25 years ago. Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill sat down and hammered out the 1986 reforms because the last reforms before that were well over 25 years ago. These things shouldn't happen once in a generation. It should be much more often that people come together around a table like this and make those hard choices that Reagan and Tip O'Neill had to make. Okay, and we well, don't have leaders doing that right okay, now. Okay, well, uh, let me ask you about that because you say that there had been no tax policy changes, but yet I remember distinctly that George Bush Sr. Mm -hmm. passed a tax increase. In fact, many say that he didn't get reelected because he said, read my lips, no new taxes, and he, and he raised taxes. Uh, Bill Clinton had both tax cuts that were kind of targeted towards the middle class. He also had some tax increases, ended up balancing the budget with Republicans. And then uh, George W. Bush came in and then reduced taxes across the board mm -hmm. and also got us in two wars and then incre and increased Medicare and spending. Exploded for the deficit. Right. Yeah, exactly. But, but let's talk about that fair tax policy because you're saying to middle class. Now, let's define the middle class. I'd like to hear your definition of middle class because there are surveys taken. Lots of people think they're middle class. Yeah. And they might be making 600000 a year. Mm -hmm. And there are other people who are making 30000 a year and they feel like they're in the middle class. How do you define middle class? Yep. Well, to, to get to your earlier point first, the other things that you outlined uh, weren't wholesale tax reform. Those were that, that was tinkering with the tax code to balance a budget in a particular year. And what we need is a, is a much more thorough examination of our tax code so that it benefits whoever thinks they are in the middle class and are actually producing you know, something of value to the local I want. I have a follow-up to that. So let's yeah. get to the middle class part, though, because sure. you've yeah. used the term again. Right, because in, in that case, again, it's, it's, which is going to vary by local economy. The, you know, what, what counts for middle class in St. Croix County uh, probably makes you part of the working poor if you live in, in lower Manhattan. Uh, so what are you doing in, in, in this local economy as a taxpayer, as a consumer, as a potential job creator? So in, in some areas, you know, the, the median income shifts a lot, but it is, again, where that vast bulk of the middle who is, is, are, are people who are not out of the workforce because they're poor, old, and disabled, or they're not making you know, such an exponential value above the median income that they're looking for more loopholes than they are jobs to create. So there, there's a lot of us that, that believe we're in the middle class. Would you agree yet, that the top 2% of wage earners or income producers uh, are not in the middle class then? Uh, certainly, if you if you look at just a, a set ratio, uh, yeah, the, the the top one two percent have received uh, you know many favors through the tax code, and while many of them have created uh, jobs, many others of them are more engaged in either outsourcing jobs or their wealth is generated through uh, investing in market activity rather than actually building, buying, or selling products or services. And so many times, those bets are against the American economy, these, these kinds of tradings in, in complex derivatives and other things that actually don't add value to the economy but make an investor money when jobs are lost. Okay, talking about tax policy and reform, you're talking about major institutional reform of the tax code, all mm -hmm. right. How about Steve Forbes' idea who ran for president I think as early as the late 80s mm -hmm. and had the idea of putting it all so you can fit it on a postcard instead of a 120 page return I think like my last one was. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what about that? Why couldn't we do it? I think, in fact, Paul Ryan's budget addressed that and said, "Let's we're going to put everyone at whatever it was, 22% or 25%, mm -hmm. and eliminate all deductions, mm -hmm. even charitable contributions. Yep. The, the problem with those policies is they always seem to have one thing in mind, and that is accelerating what is already a, an, an immense transfer of wealth 
from people at the bottom to people at the top. You know, things like the flat tax, which would be one of the, the largest giveaways of wealth from the American middle class to the top ever seen. And so people that, that write plans or support plans like that say, oh, wait, 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 we will put in these safeguards so that people, you know, aren't, uh, aren't unduly penalized if they've lost their job or if they're trying to buy their first home or if they're giving a chair and on and on they go. Pretty soon you've added enough safeguards, you end up with a tax code that we have right now. Well, would your tax code, if you were elected, and uh, would you consider yourself somebody that would be uh, it towards the middle? Are you going to try and reform the far left of the Democratic Party? Or what would you do and where would you go with a tax policy as far as how progressive it would be? Um, are you in, in the camp that, that believes that people that make 16000 and those that make $16 million should pay the same percentage of tax? Yeah, of course not. I, I believe in a progressive tax system, which we have lost sight of because we have so many loopholes, ex exemptions, and, and, and trap doors in, in the tax code. And so we need a, a tax system that is truly progressive, that rewards success, but also rewards actual job creation to a productive gross domestic product rather than rewarding wealth that is gained by shipping American jobs or American dollars outside of the country. Uh, and, and so it's, it's not about reconstituting a, a far left to go up against a far right. That's not what the voters are looking for at all. The, the voters who, who come up to me and say, look, I'm, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I just want to know why why you guys can't get along better. I mean, I, we have to get along at work. At my job, we have to cooperate. Not everybody gets what they want. Uh, when, when are more people in Washington, Madison, and other places going to start doing the same thing? And that's what needs to change is the whole climate and culture of working for the vast majority of people in your district, not your wealthiest donors or the people with the loudest megaphones in Washington or Wall Street. It sounds great in a campaign, mm -hmm. but I have haven't seen it work so much once they get inside the beltway. President Obama ran on that, said that he can be moderate, yep. that he can reach out to Republicans. Mm -hmm. Got inside the beltway yep. and we've had what we've had where budgets haven't been passed. Because by. the first thing that the, the Senate Republican leader said is it's my job to make sure that this president serves only one term. I mean, right from the get-go, the, the, the tempo was laid as far as whether there was going to be actual you know, cooperation and working together. But I'll say this much, it also does happen uh, from time to time. It, it happens in more in day-to-day in, you know, -day activity than it does in, in the, the, the big overarching policies. But, for example, in, in Congress a, a few years back, a, uh, a self-styled bipartisan uh, committee of uh, 14 uh, senators said that they were tired of all the filibustering of judicial nominees and they came together and said you know we're not going to filibuster just because the president has a D or an R next to his name. What we need are more rank and file members who are willing to stand up to their own leaders or more importantly stand up with members of the other party from time to time like I did as a legislator and say if you've got a good idea I want to talk. Keep an open door and an open mind because no one person and no one party has all the right answers. But if you go just by what the Democratic leader or what the Republican leaders say, well, they're always going to fight to win for their party and that's their job and, and bless them for it. But every so often, the rank and file have to stand up and say, no, no, actually this is what we want back home. And so that's why the majority of my bills in the legislature were passed with bipartisan votes and why I would seek out bipartisan co-sponsors because I wanted good ideas to pass. I'm not content to just Pose for holy pictures. Anybody can do that. That's called a politician. We're looking for elected leaders. We need leaders, not followers. Well, and you mentioned one. My idol happens to be Bill Proxmire. And, and 40 years ago, he was in uh, the Senate. Um, in both the Senate and the Congress, they took and, and they showed the political leanings of uh, the different people, red being the Republicans, blue. And both houses were almost divided a third, a third, a third. And in the middle, you had a, about a third gray. Now, they take that same poll 40 years later, and there's almost no gray seats in either the Senate or the House. How would you end that? Well, first off, you've got to help people feel uh, more confident in their own ability to govern from, from, from their own heart rather than from their party office. But unfortunately, we have a culture that works against that. As, as one person said when they said, how does a Michelle Bachman get so much traction in Congress for being such a junior member, albeit a loud one? And the answer was, well, you know, only half of the caucus is, is like Michelle Bachman. The other half are, being, are afraid of being primaried by somebody like a Michelle Bachman. And, and so we need both sides to tell the, the, 
extreme uh, sides of their party to, you know, we're glad you're there as a cheerleader, but to get the actual work done, we've got to work together with each other. Uh, the way that we did in the legislature to pass some you know, good common sense things that would help people from time to time or, or stand up to our own leaders. I stood up to my own governor, you know, in, in a few different instances, one of them being when he wanted to uh, defund and get rid of the, the Rural Development Board that would have uh, allowed for rural development tax zone credits to go to expanding farms and agribusinesses in rural Wisconsin. And I worked with uh, Republican members of the state assembly to block that from happening. Again, that was only going to happen through rank and file members who, uh, like Bill Proxmire, uh, fought for their district more than they fought for their party. Okay, very good. Now, uh, we just have a couple minutes, but I saw one other area was Wall Street reform. Mm -hmm. What would you propose that hasn't been already tried mm -hmm that would make a difference whether it comes to the deficit or get this economy going. The problem is that things have been uh, proposed, things have been passed, but they haven't been tried because Sean Duffy's been one of the lead voices in blocking things like the Wall Street reforms that everybody just assumed would be put in place after the crash of 2008 when banks cratered the economy because of all these risky trades they were making in derivatives and other complex uh, you know, financial instruments that you literally need a supercomputer to track. But before those reforms could even take root, Sean Duffy and others were sitting there, were named to the Financial Services Committee, blocking those reforms. And since that time have been handsomely rewarded. Uh, Congressman Duffy has received over $260,000 from the financial services sector for his actions. In, in the case of, of more recent developments, after J.P. Morgan lost a, you know, two to five billion dollars and then billions more. That was more. just in the last two weeks. Just in the last couple of weeks, we, we called on the congressman to join our call for an investigation into J.P. Morgan and it took him two weeks but he finally flip-flopped over to the right side of the issue and agreed with us that an investigation was needed. So our next question is, Congressman Duffy, when are you going to give back the money? the thousands of dollars that you took from J.P. Morgan's Political Action Committee. Some of it within seven days of writing a letter to federal watchdog agencies asking them to water down or scrap some of these Wall Street reform rules. So if Sean Duffy would rather stand with the Wall Street banks and, and be rewarded by them as they once again engage in risky borrowing that puts all of us at risk of a taxpayer-funded bailout, he can do that outside of Congress. I think we should have somebody elected from this district that's going to fight for job creation here and real American capitalism where anybody can invest, know what they're investing in, and reap the benefits. Well, uh, Pat, uh, thanks for coming. My I guess pleasure. it's Senator Kreitlow. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. And uh, appreciate your service to the state before, and, and uh, uh, good luck with the campaign now. We'll probably, hopefully, we'll be asking Sean Duffy to be on. and allow him his uh, rebuttal, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, t the voters of the district, they'll be able to see you around. I imagine you're coming back for booster right. days and Pepperfest and so forth. All over the place. It's, it's been a lot of many months of road trips and uh, many more to come. All right. Well, good luck on the campaign and thank you for your time. Thanks, Jamie, very much. You bet. And thank you for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal.